I'm always fascinated about how people choose their careers. Uh, some people seem to be born into certain careers, while others, it may take them a while to really find their, their niche. Uh, can you tell me what sparked your initial interest in science? I've always been interested in biology from as the earliest time I can remember. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, I collected butterflies. Um, I, uh, we moved from New York to, uh, to Orlando, Florida uh, when I was about 12 years old. And, uh, and then it was, Orlando then was really undeveloped. Um, it, this was way before Disneyland. And uh, it, there were many, many woods and swamps uh, around, uh, around there. And uh, um, I, I spent uh, my afternoons, uh, I was uh, interested in birds and uh, living things, and I spent my, my afternoons in the woods, in the swamps also. Um, at that time, during the Second World War, there was an air base in Orlando that had uh, a group of professional biologists. Uh, be, they were teaching um, the aviators, the pilots, how to survive if they were shot down in, uh, in the South Pacific, on the South Pacific Island. And one of them came to, to my high school and gave a talk on birds. I was interested in birds, and so I went down to talk to him uh, afterwards. And uh, two other boys also went down to talk to him. And he took us on field trips and introduced us to all of the, of the other biologists. This was a wonderful opportunity to, uh, um, uh, uh, to be in touch with, with real professionals. Um, and for example, they took us, somebody had reported that they'd found a cave down near Tampa. They took us to this, um, to this cave. We had to lower ourselves down by ropes into the cave and then crawl on our hands and knees through, through like a stream, through water that was running. And we came to, to a chamber it was about as big as this room, a little bit smaller than this room, and the floor was covered with fossils, with big, big bones, and there were fossils sticking out of the walls. And um, it, it, I've never seen a collection like that before. A uh, paleontologist came down from Harvard and found a saber-toothed tiger skull in, in these bones. It, I mean, it was a really, uh, it was a wonderful experience. So anyway, um, I, I became a biochemist uh, and, as, as I said, an, an molecular biologist, and I've always been interested in science. And what led you to NIH? Uh, when I got my PhD degree in biochemistry at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and my mentor, uh, Jim Hogg, knew um, um, Hans Stetten, Jr., who was uh, then uh, the director of the Arthritis Institute. And I had worked on carbohydrate metabolism for my PhD thesis, and uh, which was um, Stetton's uh, field. And uh, he told Stetton about me. Stetton um, invited me for coffee at a, at a meeting and uh, agreed to accept me as a postdoctoral fellow here at the NIH. That's what brought me to the NIH. And I've been here ever since. And that's like uh, 50, 52, years, 52 years ago. The NIH, the NIH, NIH I, I should say, you know, it's just a wonderful place to do work. Um, there, there are no frills, but, um, uh, but uh, good support for, uh, uh, for doing experiments and uh, wonderful equipment. It just, it's a terrific place to work. And actually, yeah, actually, well, uh, you know, the work I did, I did as an independent investigator at the NIH when I was first offered a job a position here. Um, I, I couldn't have done any place else be, um, because I decided to switch fields. And um, um, Gordon Tompkins offered me a position in his lab as an independent investigator after two years as a postdoctoral fellow. And um, I decided to switch fields and to, uh, to ask the question, um, does the information that we inherit from our parents, which determines the sequence of amino acids and proteins, which are the machinery, all the machinery that we need for, for life, um, uh, does that information come directly from DNA or 
does it come from RNA that, that's transcribed from DNA? And that was my first, uh, the first question that I asked as an independent investigator. And, you know, you're not supposed to, to uh, switch fields when you first become an independent investigator. You're supposed to prove that you're a good scientist and productive. And I thought it would take me two years just to, to learn the literature in the field, to set up the systems that I needed, um, uh, to do cell-free protein synthesis and to look to see if nucleic acids would stimulate um, uh, cell-free protein synthesis. Um, and so uh, that was a dangerous, a dangerous thing to do, but nobody would have given me a grant to do it because I had no experience in the fields. So basically the NIH is the only place I could have done it. You, you just touched on some of the work you began in 1959, uh, mm -hmm. investigations into a relationship between DNA, RNA, and the protein, production of proteins. Can you tell me more about these investigations and, and what did you discover? Well, we made, we made extracts of a bacterium, E. coli, and, uh, and, and then added DNA or RNA to these preparations to see if they would stimulate protein synthesis, stimulate amino acid incorporation into protein in these cell-free uh, extracts. And, um, and we found that, I found, I, I worked for, for about a year and a half by myself, and, um, uh, and I uh, trying to get the synthesis of a protein, and, um, and it was working. Uh, I mean, uh, we were getting a small increase in, in the synthesis of a protein. Then um, a Heinrich Matai, who was a postdoctoral fellow, came to my lab, and I decided I needed a more sensitive assay. So I switched to radioactive amino acid incorporation into protein. And uh, we very rapidly found that, that a fraction of RNA from ribosomes, which were the organelles that proteins are synthesized on, I thought if, if messenger RNA existed, it would surely be on, on these uh, organelles, um, that, that RNA from these organelles stimulated amino acid incorporation into protein, but DNA had no effect. So uh, that was the first evidence that I was aware of that messenger RNA existed. And uh, I jumped for joy when I saw the first experiment worked and all the controls were there and everything was in duplicate. I literally jumped for joy and let out a, a holler uh, because I knew that we had found something that was very exciting. And then I tried to see, to, I rounded up other kinds of RNA, including a viral RNA, to see if it would stimulate protein synthesis. And the viral RNA was like 20 to 30 times more active in stimulating protein synthesis than the RNA preparations that I had used. And uh, then uh, we used a synthetic RNA, poly-U, which contains only one kind of, of uh, letter. You know, DNA contains four kinds of letters. Protein contains 20 common uh, kinds of uh, letters, of amino acids. And so the, the, the question is, how does a four-letter code, uh, a four-letter alphabet, um, uh, determine um, the, um, uh, the sequence, the sequence of, of, of words in a 20-letter uh, alphabet for protein? Um, so anyway, we used a synthetic RNA that contained only one of the four kinds of letters and looked for the synthesis of a protein containing only one of the 20 kinds of amino acids. And we found it. We found that poly-U stimulated the incorporation of the amino acid phenylalanine. So we knew the first letter of the genetic code was a, was a sequence of U's. Um, and, and, and that opened up the entire field because it provided a very simple assay for determining the, the letters that were needed for, to code for other amino acids. We synthesized synthetic RNAs containing two kinds of, of letters or, or three kinds of letters in different combinations and, and tested them uh, uh, against uh, amino acid incorporation. In this way, we found the base, the letters that were required um, for
for codon, we showed that the three letters are required to code for, um, uh, for one amino acid. Three letters in, in RNA required for one amino acid in protein. And, um, uh, but we found that the letters that were required, but not the, not the sequence of the letters. To, to determine the sequence of the letters, we had to, we showed that, that a triplet alone, three bases, three letters in RNA alone, could serve as a message that was recognized by an adapter RNA with, a, with the appropriate amino acid attached to it. Um, and, uh, uh, and it would bind to ribosomes and we could, we could um, determine which amino acid uh, those three letters in RNA um, um, specified. And in this way, we deciphered the, uh, the genetic code, which contains 64 kinds of triplets. Every triplet has meaning uh, there. And there are many synonyms, and the synonyms are um, are arranged in, in, in a particular kind of order where the third, the third letter can vary uh, quite frequently. Um, and we also, after we, we deciphered the genetic code in E. coli, in a bacterium, we asked the question, um, is the code universal? Do higher organisms have the same genetic code? And so we determined the code in an amphibian and in mammalian tissues, and we found the identical genetic code. So this, um, um, and actually since then, subsequently, small variations in the code have been found in some organisms under certain circumstances. But, but all, all organisms that have been tested, many organisms that have been tested, uh, use the same standard code. They're all slight variations of the same standard uh, uh, code. So, so this strongly suggests that, that, uh, uh, that the code originated very early in biological evolution, that, um, that, that all forms of life on this planet are derived from a common ancestor, and that, um, that we're all related. Um, uh, all forms of life on, on Earth are related to, actually related to one another. This had a tremendous philosophic effect on me uh, actually, I knew a lot about evolution, but uh, to find this coming out of our own experiments really uh, uh, had a big impact on me. And it, it, it uh, yeah, you know, the coding of information and inheriting information from, from your parents, which tells all the information that's needed to tell, to tell um, how to, to, to build a new organism, a new uh, embryo, a, a new organism um, solves the problem of biological time because it's much easier to make a new organism than it is to fix an old and broken down organism. And this was really the work that led to you receiving the Nobel Prize. Yes, yes, right. And, and how did that feel when you, you received notification that you'd actually won the, the Nobel? Well, it was four in the morning when I received a call from Stockholm. And at first I thought that it, the boys in the lab were pl playing a trick on me, uh, were having fun. And, um, and then um, um, that, they, that morning, I mean, at 8.30 in the morning, um, the people in the lab heard about it on the radio. And um, they all came over to my house and we had a party. So uh, we had a big celebration uh, that morning, and and then and lunch afterwards. So, is it fair or accurate to say that your work was really the building block for deciphering the human genome? Yes, because because it's it, clearly it's one of the one of the major building blocks because to translate the information from in DNA into protein. Um, you need to know the, the uh, genetic code. You know, only about one and a half percent of the human genome actually codes for protein. Uh, the rest, uh, there's a lot of DNA that's involved in, in uh, regulating the expression of genes. There's a lot of DNA that, that, uh, that has um, uh, um, sequences inserted in, in the DNA 
that um, uh, this present, uh, present repetitive sequences that are present, and um, we don't know all the functions of, of, of all the DNA, but, um, but we do know enough to pick out the portions of DNA that encode um, protein, and um, there, there, there are 20 to 25,000 genes in, um, um, in, in the human genome. Each gene can encode one or more proteins, um, and um, you need a lot of different kinds of machines, machinery to, uh, to build a, a, a person. So now, after your research on the genetic code, you turned to the field of neurobiology. Yes. Why did you switch fields? Everything was going beautifully in the lab. I mean, I felt I could, I could, I could do it with one hand tied behind my back. And I was always interested in neurobiology. And there are only two systems in biology where information is encoded and uh, uh, retrieved. And the, the genes is one and and the brain is the other and so I decided to switch to um, to neurobiology because I was interested in neurobiology and I didn't know anything about it um, and you know for for five years um, I had worked as hard as I could flat out uh, to on the code deciphering the genetic code it took five years and there were, were um, um, people, postdoctoral fellows in my lab and, and, and collaborators who also worked on it, a total maybe of 20 people um, who deciphered the code. It was very much a joint uh, uh, project. Um, and uh, and so, so on the one hand, um, I, gave, I gave all the postdoctoral fellows in my lab and essentially all my lab to one of my postdoctoral fellows who was um, uh, to Tom Kasky, who could who could clearly lead everybody else in the field of protein synthesis, and that gave me the time uh, to explore different systems in neurobiology, and uh, it was a wonderful a wonderful um, time to to um, um, to explore a new field. You know, when you're working really hard and you have a lot of responsibilities, you have people. Uh, in the lab that um, we have to get papers out. I had to write a paper every every seven weeks, something of the sort. And um, um, you you sometimes you have responsibilities that have to be met before you can do things that you might want to do uh, uh, instead of those responsibilities, such as reading a journal, uh, for example, or or thinking about about problems. And um, and so, it, it, in one sense, it was a big relief to um, to jump into a new field. It was also a lot of a lot of work, and um, and I didn't want to fail. Um, uh, the, when you switch fields, you give up all all the things that um, that you've established in the lab, all the methods that you've checked out. Uh, all the information that you have about reading and reading what and knowing what what's going on uh, in the field before and you start to read new literature and uh, and to think about new problems so it was both exhilarating uh, it was really exhilarating uh, to to make the switch but tough to do it because um, uh, you want to be productive I want to read a quote to you, and it should be very familiar to you. When man becomes capable of instructing his own cells, he must refrain from doing so until he has sufficient wisdom to use this knowledge for the benefit of mankind. Decisions concerning the application of this knowledge must ultimately be made by society, and only an informed society can make such decisions wisely. Does that sound familiar? It sounds you know, very familiar. You, it's, you actually made that, that statement in 1967. Yeah. To yeah. Science. Yeah. I, I, I was supposed to give a talk um, in New York, um, a popular talk to, uh, to people, and I received an award at, at this occasion. And, um, and so I, I, I wrote this, and it was, um, to my surprise, it uh, became a, um, 
um, an editorial in, in the journal Science. And, uh, but it's, it's really true. I, I predicted at the time that it would take tw 25 years before, you know, I, I, I told the audience that, that we, know, we know the program now, how to program cells. We can write messages in nucleic acids and program cells and, and uh, the, the cellular machinery will follow those messages and make the proteins that, that those messages uh, uh, encode. Um, and, but I, I, I warned against using it in man until we understand the consequences of doing that. Um, and, and I predicted that tw in 25 years, that, that, that I said that, that there's a, there are a lot of technical problems connected with this. How to get the nucleic acids inside the cell is the major uh, uh, problem. And I predicted it would take 25 years to do it. And by coincidence, it took exactly 25 years before it was, um, it was done. So in terms of predictions, I'm batting 100. But, um, uh, but that was an accident, I think. Um, so uh, um, I, I think that those, that, that uh, warning is, uh, um, holds today. It's, it's, it's a good statement. Yeah, you are. You did predict that, and, and we're at this point now with stem cell research and all the you know these new discoveries. I think it's still a very valid. I, I think I think genetic engineering has fantastic potential. Um, th there have been some setbacks with genetic engineering where people have used DNA. You know, I, I was here at the NIH. They treated um, patients for a number of years ago. They treated patients for. Um, uh, adenosine deaminase, a genetic disease, and uh, and they helped these patients. and And uh, I was invited to a party that was held down at uh, the Senate off one of the Senate office buildings, where uh, some of the senators came and the the children who were treated, uh, who had this genetic disease, were treated here at the NIH, and the doctors who treated them came to this party, and one by one the parents of the children got up. And, and told the audience uh, how much um, it had meant to them to see their children helped by, by the work that the people, uh, the doctors here at the NIH did. It was a very moving experience for me to meet the children, to meet the parents, and um, it was very, very, very moving. Um, it was terrific. There have been setbacks with, with genetic engineering. For example, um, um, I think when, when you, if, if the DNA is incorporated, that you add uh, which to, to, um, uh, to remedy the genetic defect uh, gets in the cell. It can be inserted in the DNA almost any place in the DNA, and uh, that, it causes mutations. And it's inserted in the wrong place. If it causes the wrong kind of mutation, it can cause cancer. And, uh, and, uh, Somebody was killed, um, or several, I don't know how many, one, one person I think, maybe more, um, uh, was actually killed by, by, uh, by this procedure. So it's not without danger. Uh, and, and that was a setback for the entire field. But I think that, that when people learn how to insert DNA that will cure genetic diseases um, uh, in the right place, uh, so that you won't cause um, uh, mutations, um, uh, uh, harmful mutations, that is, um, then genetic engineering is just going to take off and it's going to be a tremendous boon to mankind because it's going because there are no cures for most of these um, genetic diseases as of today. Now, you know, beyond the laboratory, I did my research, you've had a very active professional and political life. Uh, and lent your name, your time, and your efforts to many worthwhile activities. Um, now, you know, a lot of researchers sort of have tunnel vision and they just want to be buried in their work. So how did you develop such a strong social conscience? Well, um, I think most people have a social conscience. And um, people send, send me letters to, uh, to, 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 to add my name to. 
um, uh, to letters that, that are circulated for good causes, which I always do. Um, I always try to, to do that. Um, and, and I think that that's um, um, a, a consequence of winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, and so I've always um, added my name to, to, uh, to, good, to letters uh, uh, describing good causes. Um, um, and, but beyond that, you've also encouraged young people in, in, to pursue yes. careers in science. You, I've, I've had I've had wonderful postdoctoral fellows, and uh, there've been more than a hundred postdoctoral fellows who have come through the lab. Two of them, actually, um, was were awarded the Nobel Prize uh, for the work that they did uh, after they left the lab, um, and and so I've always felt incredibly fortunate to have had such wonderful people uh, in the lab. And actually, I've learned a lot from them. They taught me an awful lot. So uh, it's, it's been a, um, uh, a source of great pleasure to work with them. Now, you, you mentioned some of the research that you're currently conducting. Would you like to sort of elaborate on some of the current research you're doing? Well, we're doing um, six problems in the lab. But, but one problem that was just published a couple of weeks ago uh, is, is, is really interesting. Uh, that is, uh, Dr. Zahuni, who was the former director of the, of the NIH, established a world-class screening center here at the NIH and a group of people to, who were really experts to run it. And they have robots that will do one and a half million assays a day. Now, I used to do these assays myself. I could do 60, maybe 80 assays a day and it was a really long day. This does one and a half million assays a day. I, I, I figured that a skilled it would take a skilled technician 125 years to do what, these robot, what this robot will do in a single day. And so um, uh, the availability of this, of this equipment that I'd never seen before uh, here at the, N at the NIH, actually they they established this equipment at various universities as well um, around the country. But the availability of it here um, enabled me to, to do a, a project um, to, to screen for compounds that uh, are potentially uh, would enhance long-term memory as, as a, th a potential therapy for, for patients with Alzheimer's disease, for example. And um, we used tissue culture cells, and uh, we had an assay. It was known that there's a gene regulator uh, called CREB, binds to DNA, and it brings another protein to DNA that will modify the proteins that are attached to DNA, and will activate genes, will regulate gene expression. And uh, that this is required to establish long-term memory. And so we, we screened 73,000 compounds and did a concentration curve of every compound and found 1,800 compounds that are potentially um, therapies for and, and may enhance long-term memory. Now, uh, this is tissue culture work that, that we did. So some of the, com some of the compounds actually um, um, have to be and will be tested in the mouse to see if they, if they enhance long-term memory in the mouse. Uh, but we found very interesting compounds, including a new class of uh, compound that, um, that the, the chemists at the screening facility made 77 derivatives of this compound and tested them and patented one of them and sold the patent to a, a biotechnology company. Um, it was a very interesting experience to uh, um, uh, to to do this work, so and, and this work is ongoing, but it's, but uh, it's just been published a few weeks ago. That's one of the things we're doing. We're also we screened um, in Drosophila in the fruit flies. The fruit flies, you know, half of the, of the genes in the fruit flies are the same as the genes or similar to the genes uh, in man, and mechanisms of of uh, uh, molecular mechanisms, many of them are virtually identical uh, in man and, and the fly. So the fly is a very useful model organism because um, it, it um, 
you can use genetics. The life cycle uh, or from egg to egg um, is about 10 days. And so you can do genetics with these and you can do things with fruit flies that it would be impossible to do or too expensive to do with, with mice. And so we use this as a, as a model a model organism. And we look for genes that affect the assembly of the nervous system in the embryo. And um, we screened about half of the genome and uh, we found 65 genes that um, are needed to, to, uh, uh, to assemble a normal nervous system. If you knock out any one of those genes, uh, it disturbs the structure of the nervous system. Uh, that's another thing that we've done. And then we've, we've studied uh, several gene regulators that um, are extremely interesting. One of them initiates neural development, the very first step that initiates neural development in part of the central nervous system. And um, it uh, has uh, a homologue that's present in man and mice. And uh, there, there are seven copies of this gene in, in the mouse. Um, that presumably formed during evolution by gene duplication and then mutated, so they're slightly different. And, um, and it determines the, the, um, the cell type of 11 of the 31 neuroblasts that are, re that, that are required in each half of a segment of, of, of Drosophila to form the what's equivalent to the spinal cord. And, uh, and so we've studied this for years and um, um, and uh, we we found inf information on how it's regulated and how a pattern of neuroblasts is established in the central nervous system. Those are some of the things that, that we've been doing. I just have one final question for you. Now, I know you've been offered professorships at a number of universities across the U.S. Uh, so what was it about NIH that made you decide to stay here? Well, the NIH is a wonderful place. Um, it's, as I said, it, it, there are no frills uh, here, but, but they're wonderful working conditions. You can do whatever you want, and um, you can uh, do whatever research that really you think is good research. Um, I, yeah, I've been, I've been offered um, positions that almost every major university. And um, I, the, the reason I stayed, I, one of the major reasons I stayed here, first of all, I like the NIH. The, the people are terrific and they're helpful. And I've established collaborations uh, with, with some of the people that have been extremely productive and, uh, and satisfying, really enjoyable. Um, then, then uh, if you're in a university, you spend about a third of your time writing grants. And I thought that, that the thing that, that, that I had least of uh, was time. And that I could use that time uh, to do useful work instead of writing grants. Um, uh, so, you know, in universities, they offer more money, more space, more people to work with, more prestige. Uh, but, uh, but at the NIH, you have a, a better opportunity to get work done. And, uh, and so I think, I think the NIH is a superb institution. And, um, you know, it's just been, been uh, a wonderful place to work.